Welcome back. Short lecture today on expertise. We'll break expertise down into learning, engagement, and, for want of a better word, caution. First off, what are we talking about when we say the word expertise? It is not just the possession of a high degree of skill. Expertise is a relative metric. We are not all experts in reading, but we all in university have an amazing ability, a very high skill level in reading. If I picked you up and placed you somewhere where there are no other English speakers, you would be the expert in speaking English and reading English. Why? Because it's a relative determination. So how do we learn the way an expert would learn? How do we get so advanced in terms of relative skills and abilities in whatever environment we're in to reach the level of expert? In other words, in competitive situations where there are multiple potential experts because there are many skilled people, how does one become the or one of the experts? Experts get data, they learn from their errors, hopefully quickly, and they update their knowledge as frequently as possible. We've looked at many tricks for making sure we get all of our data or all of the potential data from all four quadrants of reality, not just what supports our confirmation bias, not just what is obvious, not just what is available, this is the beginning of a scientific epistemology or a scientific approach to knowledge. The next step is figuring out how the data could show you that you're wrong. In other words, being capable of learning from the data, whether it confirms or disconfirms whatever model or understanding of reality you are working with. Because if you're working with reality at all, you do have a model of it. Even if it's naive epistemic relativism, that's still a model. So we get data, we figure out how to learn from our errors, and we update knowledge based on these data and based on inevitable errors. So this should hearken us back to falsifiability from intro psych. Is your understanding of the world clear and actionable enough that said understanding could be shown to be effective or ineffective based on how reality responds to it or based on how it interacts with reality. In a sense, whether reality teaches you something depends in part on your approach to reality. The shallow version of this being confirmation bias or the biases we discussed that are associated with Google and the deeper version of this being the philosophy of pragmatism discussed in the probability lecture. So we are most teachable when our models and beliefs are succinct enough and actionable enough to be tested by reality in a way that they could fail to be effective. Two lawyers are in the break room at the law firm. One's making toast, and as he's buttering the toast, he says, Have you ever noticed that whenever you drop a piece of toast, it always falls butter side down? It's always the worst case scenario. Without saying anything, the second lawyer steps on the first lawyer's foot. Ow! The first lawyer drops his toast. But it lands butter side up. And the second lawyer says, well, it looks like you've lost that case. But the first lawyer just says, yeah, or I buttered the wrong side. The first lawyer has an unfalsifiable belief about what happens when you drop a piece of toast. He does not get to learn from reality when reality shows him that, in fact, a dropped piece of toast could land on either side. Rather than learn that, he adds to his strange biased theory that there is some cosmically correct side on which to butter your toast. Recall that falsifiability requires your idea, your belief, your hypothesis to be capable of being tested and proven incorrect. The reason why this guy from the History Channel specials about how aliens built the pyramids is not considered a scientist, or rather his ideas are not scientific, specifically because they can't be shown to be incorrect. They also don't add too much to our understanding of the world, but his idea that aliens constructed the pyramids can't be shown to be incorrect. This guy can't learn from a reality that includes him being incorrect. It's verifiable because aliens or ninth dimensional beings could come and visit us and say, hey, how are our pyramids doing? Did you take good care of them? No, typical, typical three-dimensional beings. 
or we could discover some cool remains that are exobiological. There's potential ways to corroborate or, or demonstrate correct his theory, or the hypothesis of aliens having built a pyramid. But if it happens to be the case that we live in the universe where the pyramids on Earth were not built by aliens, this guy doesn't get to find out about it because we have no current way to search the entirety of the universe for signs of alien life. And even if we did have that technology, there's nothing to say that these aliens aren't ninth dimensional beings that are completely undetectable with our current level of science. Consider a scenario where aliens come back to Earth and they say, oh yes, we were on Earth before, hello, we're back. And then we say, oh great, did you guys make the pyramids when you were here before? And they say, no, we didn't make the pyramids. And then we say, oh, do you know who did? Have we therefore falsified the idea that aliens made the pyramids? No, not necessarily. This alien could be lying to us, and maybe they did build the pyramids, but they don't want credit for it. Or maybe it was a different set of aliens that built the pyramids, because now we've just demonstrated that intelligent life exists and can visit us. So if anything, this refusal or denial from the first set of aliens we met just might make us more likely to believe that this, there's some other set of aliens that made the pyramids. Now this is not to say that it is impossible to falsify a theory that involves aliens making the pyramids. All this guy would have to do, all this History Channel guy would have to do, is make his theory sophisticated enough and specific enough that he can specify what observations in reality would disconfirm his hypothesis that aliens built the pyramids, or disconfirm other hypotheses that constitute his theory. If he could point us to specific instances or observations or things that are possible to observe, that we could possibly observe in the future, that if we saw them would disconfirm, discorroborate his idea that aliens built the pyramids, then he would have a scientific hypothesis on his hands. A scientific theory. But the therefore aliens guy doesn't do that. The Egyptologists and archaeologists who do create falsifiable statements or models of how the pyramids were built get specific enough that they'll posit things like, well I imagine if you had four strong people with levers or log rollers and you had a ramp inclined at an eight degree grade you could probably move a boulder as big as this large boulder up to where we find it on the Pyramid of Giza today. So this academic picks the biggest, most challenging piece and says, if my theory works for this most difficult piece to move, then it'll probably work for the smaller pieces as well. So there's actually a few principles being used here. First, you want to test your idea where your idea is most likely to fail, because that's the most stringent test. If I say I'm the world champion, I'm the best possible arm wrestler in the world, I don't prove that by saying it. I can't prove that if I've never arm wrestled somebody, and my falsifiable test is not going to be me arm wrestling your grandmother. If I actually want to test the idea that I'm the best arm wrestler in the world, I have to wrestle the strongest available individual, i.e. I have to test my assertion where it is most likely to fail if I want it to be taken seriously at all. So we're specifying what would prove our theory wrong and we're looking for the test most capable of proving our theory wrong. And this is how we're demonstrating that the idea is worthy of being taken seriously. An example that I particularly like regarding falsifiability is the end of the world. Let's say someone is telling me that the end of the world is coming. Because people are telling us this, whether they're religious leaders, doomsday cultists, global warming alarmists, ancient civilizations that left behind, calendars with abrupt endings. There's always at least one person telling us the world is ending. But it takes a particular sort of chutzpah to specify a date. So the Christian idea of rapture is the removal of individuals from Earth up to the heavens. I was only seven years old in 1992, but I don't recall a rapture happening. I do remember these billboards, though. These could be found in Toronto. The Bible guarantees Judgment Day, May 21st, 2011. Thank you for the heads up, FamilyRadio.com. But of course, Judgment Day is a little vague. 
I don't recall seeing any Arnold Schwarzenegger robots on May 21st, 2011, but I'm not sure that that's what Judgment Day entails. I do know what Earth destruction means, though, and three months after May 21st, the Earth was supposed to be destroyed, and I don't think that happened, despite the fact that the Bible guaranteed it, though I don't recall that verse. And here's the example that likely more of us remember, the end of the world due to the end of the Mayan calendar. Now, to be fair, nowhere was it written that the end of the world had to occur quickly. So maybe the end of the world started ending, and maybe for the past seven odd years, the world has been slowly ending. But aside from my overly charitable interpretation here, I think we can safely say that these calls for the end of the world were falsified. So I assume a lot of the scaremongers then apologized after the date, after October 21st, 2011. I'm sure Harold Camping came out and said, oh, sorry, my bad. I'm sure he got out and carried a sign around like this that said, yesterday in this space, I predicted that the world would come to an end. It did not, however, so I regret any inconvenience this may have caused. But just because there's no apology doesn't mean that I learned nothing. Here's the, the Bible guarantees it. Judgment Day crowd after May 21st, 2011. Well, something did happen on May 21st, 2011. It was just an invisible thing. The Lord, in her infinite wisdom, decided to judge the good and the bad people, such that if you were born after May 21st, 2011, you were apparently born damned because God stopped saving people. But what I want to point out is that the language changed Rather than saying the Earth will be destroyed on October 21st, 2011, this group is saying there's a strong likelihood that October 7th, 2015 will be the end of the world. Baby steps. Baby steps in epistemic development. And if you want, down at the bottom of the poster there, there's a Facebook page. You can go there and see what they've been doing for the last five years. See if they've got another date for the end of the world. Also see whether they're making cool posters like this still. The Last Day 2015, starring Strong Likelihood. This is progress, this is development, because they're acknowledging that they may be wrong. And the words in red are just a bit of a play on a popular Bible verse. So recognizing that we might be wrong is the beginning of wisdom. Some of you may know the original proverb, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And we can put those together and say something along the lines of, Nothing quite puts the fear of God in you like being wrong, or learning that you could be wrong. And I typically hold this up as an example of individuals not learning from being wrong, but they are, they're just not learning what most of us would probably prefer for them to learn, which is not to make random doomsday prophecies. Even if they haven't yet learned not to make doomsday prophecies, they at least have learned that maybe uh, this prophecy could be incorrect. This would be a win for Charles Pierce, who, in the probability lecture we saw, argued that reality is corrective of error. The words strong likelihood indicate that these individuals do, in fact, have the fear of being wrong. The beginning of wisdom. Saying strong likelihood, at least compared to saying the Bible guarantees it, is aporia. Aporia is an acknowledgement or a profession of doubt, of uncertainty. And I put Socrates up here because when I read Socratic dialogues, the turn toward aporia is, for me, the big action climax of the dialogue. The typical recipe for a Socratic dialogue is you have Socrates, and Socrates wants to meet the expert on a given topic, whether the topic is love or justice or truth, because he has so many questions. Because Socrates admits that he knows nothing, so he wants to ask the most basic questions of these experts. And he does, over the course of the dialogue. But over the course of the dialogue, he starts to reveal, through his questions and through the expert or his interlocutor's answers to those questions, he starts to reveal that the expert might not know as much as he thinks he does. And over the course of the dialogue, the expert comes to realize this, and eventually has a moment where they either admit or explicitly reveal that they do not know that of which they speak or that of which they are an expert. And, of course, to make themselves feel better about their ignorance, they attribute infinite wisdom to Socrates for having revealed or demonstrated their own lack of knowledge. 
Which, by the way, the psychodynamicists have a defense mechanism name for that. It's called valuation. Oh, you're smarter than me? Well, to protect my ego, I'm going to say that you're probably the smartest person in the world. But, of course, Socrates is wise because he says, I know nothing. The fact that my ignorance got you to reveal yours does not imply that I am wise. But, of course, we never quite believe Socrates. We think both that he must be wise and he probably knows it. But both Socrates and his interlocutor in any given dialogue are showing us how to grow wisdom. They're engaging in questioning, picking things apart, looking for inconsistency. A Socratic dialogue is a demonstration of how simple discussion can lead us to truth, and that was, this is key to Platonic ideas of truth. You'll come through discussion to the perfect idea of truth, or the core idea of what justice is, or love is, if you engage in discussion. The discussion will show you the truth, and it is a truth regarding your mind. Socrates is, in a sense, not necessarily wise himself, but maybe a source or a catalyst of wisdom. If you're pretty sure about something you know, and you have a chat with Socrates, and the chat with Socrates reveals to you that you actually don't know something you thought you knew really well, then you gained wisdom. That's not necessarily wisdom that Socrates specifically had that he gave to you. Rather, in your discussion with Socrates, he helped you to make your own wisdom. He provided a test for you. Rather than accepting everything you said as the expert in your field, he questioned. And while that revealed you to be wrong, the human intellect is rather anti-fragile with regards to correction even if this is not necessarily true of the human ego. So here's Super Mario. What's the epistemological lesson that we can learn from Super Mario? You gotta reach for the questions. That's how you grow, and that's how you get cool superpowers. Imagine Super Mario without the questions. No falsifiability, no conversations with Socrates. He just stays small. One little Goomba can take him out. One of the reasons psychology as a discipline is rather obsessed with scientific method and showing how it is a scientific academic discipline is because whenever we try to lay out what effective thinking is, we find ourselves mostly just repeating the scientific method. The best thinking is the scientific method scaled down to the individual. So science helps humanity and culture test its ideas, move beyond them, increase its capacity to feed people, save people, travel through space. But scientific principles don't just help cultures and civilizations keep up with the needs of a growing populace. They also help any given individual in that culture or civilization keep up with the growing needs or demands that existing in said more complex situation entails. That is, the principles that helped civilization grow can help you grow as well. So why do we want our models of the universe to be falsifiable? Because we want to keep learning. We don't just want to feel correct, we want to actually be correct. And this is not for the purpose of academic philosophy so that we can think the eternal thinks. This is because being correct confers certain moral and material advantages. Whether it's not living in anxiety, whether it's freedom to help yourself grow, help other people grow. Because if it was just about sitting in an armchair and thinking the eternal thinks, if it was just knowledge for knowledge's sake, well, we could get the subjective benefit of knowledge for knowledge's sake by simply being ignorant of things and then refusing to learn from our ignorance. And if this is what we want, then we need to guard against the fact that we may be in the world where we're wrong. So we should prepare ourselves to be capable of learning in that world, i.e. we should, wherever possible, cultivate falsifiable beliefs and models of the world. The most basic necessity for which is being specific enough that you know what could prove you wrong and what specifically would be proven wrong, what belief, perspective, approach, etc. And this is where higher education comes in. What we're supposed to do is we're supposed to teach you how to think and how to write. What specifically do you think, know, or believe? You cannot avoid this question entirely, though you can avoid it being asked of specific things. So it's specificity on top of which we can make testability. And where there's testability, you can track your results. 
One of the reasons it can be useful to track your results is that we forget when our beliefs, when our politics, when our own personal metaphysics change, our memories of what we used to believe tend to change along with them, far more than we think that our beliefs change. Now we've learned enough about memory to understand why this would happen. We don't have perfect videotape recall of the past. It's all filtered through whatever current associative networks our neurons have now. So it makes sense that our brains would rewrite or reconstruct the past in a way that's more consistent with our current beliefs. An example of tracking how people's beliefs change and how people do not understand or do not recall how much their beliefs changed was published in 1986 by Greg Marcus. He started this in 1973 when he asked around 1900 people for their views on certain topics. Should we guarantee living standards or let people get ahead on their own? So which do you endorse? The guaranteeing of living standards or letting people getting, get, get ahead on their own? pick which you endorse, or if you think you'd be right in the middle of those two options, then pick four. Should we protect the rights of the accused, or stop crime even at the risk of violating rights? This is the age-old question in the justice system. How do we calibrate our false positive and false negative rates in the justice system, i.e., in order to protect individuals from being falsely put into prison, how many guilty people are we okay with accidentally letting them go free. North American jurisprudence is generally on the side of protecting the rights of the accused, and any student of any history will tell you that that's probably the better side to be on, because if we're even a little okay with violating the rights of innocent individuals, oppression is probably not far behind. Should we help minority groups specifically, or let them help themselves? Should we legalize marijuana or set penalties for use higher? Now keep in mind, they're asking in 1973. Attitudes were far different then. For example, this question wouldn't even exist on a survey today. Should women and men have equal roles or is women's place in the home? And finally, do you hold liberal or conservative political views generally? These are just some examples of the questions that they were asking these individuals in 1973. When they followed up, nine years later, most of the participants had changed quite a bit in terms of their beliefs. And with these changes came considerable changes, or rather differences, between what they said in 1973 and what they recall in 1982 having said in 1973. In other words, we're asking people not just what they currently believe in 1982, but also, what did you believe in 1973? Recall, as best you can, the answer you gave us nine years ago. So in 1973, we asked both parents and their kids, or offspring, for their beliefs. Looking at the offspring first, let's look at a question that we're likely to see lots of change on. Women and men should have equal roles versus women's place in the home. Were you very much in favor of equal roles? Then you would have said one or two. Were you very much in favor of a woman's place being in the home? Then you would have said six or seven. Those in favor of women and men having equal roles tended to remember their stance from nine years previously, but only 56% of them remembered precisely their stance on this issue. Not surprisingly, those who we might now see as against the zeitgeist or even against history, i.e. those who said that woman's place is in the home, were less likely to remember their 1973 belief. Only 33% of them recalled their 1973 stance correctly. Now looking at the older individuals, the parents, those in favor of equal roles, only 44% remembered their initial stance correctly, and those who endorsed women's place as being in the home, only 28% of them remembered that stance correctly. So by how much were people changing their views on this question over the course of nine years? 22% of the sample changed their views on the liberal and conservative scale question by three points or more and did not recall any change at all. 
So 159 participants moved three or more points toward the liberal side, and when asked what their prior beliefs were, said that they were always where they are now. 43 individuals moved three or more points toward the conservative side, and likewise did not recall ever being different than what they are now. This was similar for the older individuals as well. About 30% of the parents we talked to in 1973 moved their political beliefs by half of the scale from 1973 to 1982, but in 1982 thought that they had been, in 1973, the same as they are now. In other words, a whole bunch of people quite radically changed their beliefs, but don't think that their beliefs had changed. Okay, but is this relevant to anything? It was a while ago. Maybe this stuff doesn't generalize to you specifically. All right, let's try to find something that should be more specific to you. How about a bunch of undergraduates in a course about thinking? If their beliefs change, will they know that their beliefs have changed? One thing that seems to be the focus of lots of critical thinking types of courses. Sometimes these courses are called how to think about weird things, but a mainstay of the curricula for them is thinking about paranormal types of beliefs. Many of the professors see themselves as inveighing against these concepts like extrasensory perception, alien abductions, superstitions, etc. So the researchers saw this as a good chance to see whether people can adequately track their changed beliefs, whether, whether people will, will realize that their beliefs have changed. So in their words, most Americans, even many with advanced educational degrees, hold paranormal, superstitious, and pseudoscientific beliefs. Indeed, neither general science knowledge nor a scientific major consistently hinders such beliefs. Limited research suggests, however, that university courses that directly and skeptically examine paranormal and pseudoscientific phenomena may reduce student beliefs in them, at least in the short term. So we have an intervention that tends to work and change people's beliefs. Let's see whether people are aware or not that their beliefs have changed. Here are the pre- and post-belief results. These are the students' beliefs in psychic powers. The solid line with the diamonds indicate the students in the skepticism or critical thinking class, whereas the dashed line with the circles is the comparable control group, i.e. students at the same institution just taking a different course. So we see that in the critical thinking course, student beliefs in psychic powers, or at least their stated beliefs in psychic powers, dropped by 21%. They went from 4, so rather neutral on the issue, to mm, about 2.5. And, and what specific statements are we looking at here? Statements like some people can foresee the future, uh, extrasensory perception is real, psychically sensing when family members are in trouble is something that people can do. Some dreams predict future events. So these are the types of statements that people were endorsing less after the critical thinking course. One thing to note here is that religious beliefs didn't seem to change much. So the critical thinking slash skepticism course did not change people's belief in Satan, hell, heaven, and God. But something tells me they were likely not targeting that as precisely as they were targeting things like astrology and psychics. But all of that wasn't the point. The point was whether individuals would be able to recall their prior beliefs or not. Now just to assure you that things were done quite fairly, this is the language from the test. Please read each statement and try to recall how strongly you either believed or disbelieved it the last time you completed this questionnaire. So students are asked very specifically, what answer did you give us before? We do not want you to respond according to your current beliefs, but rather according to your beliefs before you took this course. So it's a simple recall type of question. Will students report that their beliefs changed? Because for many of them, they did. On average, especially on the psychic powers question, belief or endorsement went down markedly. What do you think? Will students report that their beliefs changed accurately? Will they report less change than actually occurred? Or will they report more change than actually occurred? As with the individuals polled in the 70s and the 80s, the difference between people's remembered 
prior beliefs and their current beliefs is much less than the difference between their current beliefs and their actual prior beliefs. The course had made them more skeptical, as we saw, and they recalled themselves as having been more skeptical before the course than they actually had been. Hopefully that example is a little more relevant to you than the example from the 70s. There's of course a term for this, illusory consistency. We see ourselves as more consistent than we actually are. This seems to have more to do with how we construct a personal narrative than actual memory or consistency biases because in some contexts we're biased to see change across time. If we go in for treatment, whether psychological or otherwise, we tend to exaggerate our prior suffering once we reach the end of treatment, perhaps in part because we want to justify the treatment. So here our bias is to see change. But we saw illusory consistency with the students, presumably because the students were invested in the narrative of being right, and they likely see their current beliefs as being right, and recall themselves as being more close to being what they currently see as correct in the past as a result of their changed beliefs. Another example study, but of course this time we're going back again to the 70s. This was published in 1973. We took 74 high school students. They rated their attitudes towards certain opinions including towards the issue of busing, uh, which involved taking predominantly white students from rural school zones and busing them to schools with predominantly black students in urban areas, and taking the predominantly black students from the urban schools and busing them to predominantly white rural schools. On issues like this, we assessed these high school students' attitudes and then, some days later, we manipulated these attitudes. We used what we called an experimental confederate, i.e. a slightly older high school student, and we used this student to change the beliefs of those against busing to be in favor of busing, and to change the beliefs of those in favor of busing to be against busing. And there were only four neutral students, and we just removed them from the experiment. There were 31 students whose attitudes were in favor of busing. And when we presented them with arguments as to why busing should stop, 88% of these students changed to being anti-busing, changed their attitudes. The 39 who, in initial assessment, were against busing, 64% of these were persuaded to be for the practice of busing. Now what we came for, do they remember their prior beliefs now that we have changed them, or at least most of them have had their beliefs changed? The pro-busing group's mean rating on the 31-point scale was 8.56. That's on average how in favor of busing the pro-busing group was. But then, of course, we changed them, we changed their attitudes, using this one persuasive student who presented the argument against busing, and now we ask them, what was your initial attitude regarding busing? Keep in mind, they were all pro-busing. We managed to convince 88% of them to be anti-busing. What do they remember, on average, their attitude to be? On average, their recalled initial position was that they had scored 26 out of 31, in other words, very much against busing. These high school students are, on average, extremely wrong about what they initially believed. They do not recall correctly their initial beliefs. The beliefs that, on average, they thought they had was nearly identical to the anti-busing group's actual initial anti-busing average. But, of course, the initially anti-busing group, we convinced 61% of them to be pro-busing, their original actual attitudinal mean was 26. When we, after convincing them to be pro-busing, ask them, what was your prior belief? The average is 17, so not quite as dramatic. So the average distance, or error, between people's actual initial scores, or initial attitudes, and what they later recalled their attitudes to be is huge. It's nearly half the scale. It's 42% of the scale. 
Basically, if you want to know what people currently believe, ask them what they used to believe. And if you want to know what people used to believe, don't ask them. They apparently don't know. Some other examples of illusory consistency, a lot of these come from studies by Ross. When we get individuals to write essays that argue against the beliefs that they actually hold, we tend to see that they change their beliefs quite a bit in the direction of the essays that we had them write. Now, if you're writing a proper essay and, and being reflective, it's actually not too surprising that it changes your beliefs. This is one of the reasons why we write. But in these paradigms, when we ask people whose beliefs have changed to simply tell us what they recall about their beliefs before their beliefs changed, their current memories of what their past beliefs are are so inaccurate that they are statistically closer to their current beliefs than they are to their prior beliefs. A quote from Ross, 1989, the figures are so similar that it would appear that we had asked for their current attitudes rather than their initial attitudes. So who cares? Do we really need perfect memory for our prior beliefs? Isn't illusory consistency useful to us in terms of ego defenses and isn't it rather harmless? Well, one area where this may be of importance is memory. Quoting a study from Social Cognition in 2012, when individuals do not realize that their attitudes have changed, they falsely remember acting in ways consistent with their current attitude. In other words, your inability to recall your prior beliefs is going to mess with your memory for what you actually did back when you believed other things. Here's an example that seems obvious. Whether you currently smoke, toke, or drink is going to influence your recall of how much you did that in the past. So if you smoke now, you're probably going to be more likely to remember, or think that you remember, or report that you smoked more in the past. And these studies have observed that the farther back into the past we're getting you to remember, the more your current behavior biases or influences your estimate of your past behavior toward being more consistent with your current behavior. And the more your behavior has actually changed, where we actually have measures of your prior behavior and your current behavior, the more your current behavior, what you do now, is going to bias or make incorrect your estimate or recall of that past behavior. So this illusory consistency isn't just about beliefs and attitudes, it's also about memories for behaviors, things you actually did. So we recall ourselves, erroneously, as having engaged in behaviors in the past that are more consistent with the beliefs that we currently hold. This relation actually works in the other direction as well, since we already know that we can mess with people's memories rather effectively. We were able to demonstrate that when we go in and change people's memories, even for rather trivial events, this can influence attitudinal change in the present. So this is a study by Fry, Lord, and Brady in 2012. They gave people a false memory for engaging in an action and found that it changed people's beliefs. In the initial round, we had a bunch of yes or no questions about actions, whether they'd performed these actions or not. For example, have you ever talked to a gay man? Participants said yes or no. Three of the actions that were coded as positive and that the participants said they had not engaged in were selected and three weeks later we had individuals back and they were randomized to either write fictional accounts of four scenes, three of which were the positive actions that the participant had not performed, or if the coin came up tails, the individual would just read an article arguing in favor of gay rights. And then three weeks after that, Participants were once again asked the yes or no questions, including the three that had been selected out. And this simple writing of the four scenes was enough to get more of the participants than in the control group to have false memories of actually having engaged in the behaviors. So of those three positive actions that were selected out, on average, participants were now recalling that they had completed one and a half of those actions. So just getting participants to write 
the little fictional stories or scenes involving these actions was enough to give us a 50% false memory implantation rate. Although the control group also had a 25 to 30% false memory rate as well. But this is all old news from the first third of the course. We know about false memory implantation and how easy it is. The question is, did these now implanted memories influence people's attitudes toward gay individuals? Yes, and we can infer that it was not simply writing the scenes involving these behaviors, such as opening the door for a gay man, but rather the actual false memory that is influencing the attitudes because we did not see on the checklists attitudinal change between the first meeting and the second meeting where they wrote the scenes, but we did see attitudinal change between the second meeting and the third meeting. Moreover, just to make doubly sure that it is the false memories that are causing the attitudinal change, the memory errors were statistically predictive of the attitude change. In other words, the more participants incorrectly recalled engaging in positive behaviors toward gay people, the more their attitudes changed to be more positive towards them. Arguably, this is hacking the illusory consistency bias. So if you can get someone to obtain a false memory of engaging in an action, then that's likely to work towards changing their attitudes to be consistent with that action that they now have a false memory of. Okay. But this is a lecture on expertise. What does this have to do with expertise? One area in which we are embarrassingly poor performers is in recalling when we have been wrong. We can't even remember when we're different, never mind when we were so different from our current belief that we were what we would now call wrong. In other words, illusory consistency in its different flavors will prevent you from having insight into your growth, your errors, your fallibility, etc. This could be in part why planning bias is so persistent and pervasive. If people's budgets for projects are off by orders of magnitude consistently, why don't their estimates get better? Well, maybe they don't remember their initial estimates. Or maybe they don't remember that they were actually quite confident in those initial estimates. Because what could happen is they could say, well, I'm pretty certain about this estimate that I have now. This one's probably not going to increase by an order of magnitude over time because I'm really sure about it. Yes, it's documented that I've been quite wrong in the past about these things, but I probably wasn't as certain in the past as I am now, so it probably doesn't count. So, at the end of this course, will you be an expert in your own thinking and biases? How would I predict your metacognitive abilities to fare now that you have learned some important contextualizing aspects of your messy three pounds of meat that thinks? To answer that, we can see how undergraduate estimates of their own vulnerability to common cognitive biases get filtered through Lake Wobegon effects. So here are undergrads rating their own perceived susceptibility to a bias, that's the black bars, next to their estimates of how vulnerable to these biases the average American is. A Lake Wobegon effect is observable in the difference between the heights of the bars. There's not a single bias that individuals on average think they might be more susceptible to than other individuals. Let's take these in order, fittingly starting with self-serving bias. This is the tendency to take credit for your successes and deny responsibility for your failures. The scale goes from 1 to 9. On average, undergraduate students seem to think that the average person is... 7.5 out of 9 vulnerability points susceptible. But I am only a 5 out of 9 in terms of risk for this bias, is what the students say on average. A difference of 2.5 out of 9, which is a big chunk of the scale. Self-interest bias is our tendency to think that decisions that are good for us are actually or also for the greater good. And this is one I see fairly often with students will argue for the quote-unquote fairness of something while in fact asking 
to be treated in such a way that is unfair to the rest of the class. It's either a terrible disingenuous argument on their part, or an honest mistake in reasoning. How vulnerable are other people to this? 7.5 out of 9. How vulnerable am I to this? Just 6 out of 9. Reactive devaluation. The tendency to think your stuff, your ideas, your contributions are better than other people's, even when they are the exact same thing. George Carlin has a good joke for this. Have you ever noticed that other people's stuff is junk, but your junk is stuff? How vulnerable are other people to this bias? 6.5 out of 9. How vulnerable am I to it? Well, about 5 out of 9. The fundamental attribution error. Quite a difference here. We blame the behavior of others more on their character and our own behavior more on our circumstance. How vulnerable are other people to this bias? 5.25 out of 9. How vulnerable am I to this bias? 3.5 out of 9. The halo effect. If somebody's high on one desirable trait, we tend to rate them higher on others. How susceptible are others to this? 7.5 out of 9. How susceptible am I to this? Maybe a 6 out of 9. Hostile media bias. The more you identify with a group of people, or a cause, or a political party, the more you tend to think that articles, representations, discussions about said thing are somehow hostile to it or against it. This is hostile media bias. How susceptible are other people to this bias? 6.5 out of 9. How susceptible am I to it? 4.75 out of 9. Biased assimilation. You're presented with neutral information. That is information that could support your view. It could support a view diametrically opposed to yours. Do you count neutral data as being in favor or as supporting your beliefs. Other people are about a 6 out of 9 in terms of vulnerability to this bias. I am a 5 out of 9. Dissonance reduction. Remembering the Festinger and Carl Smith measure of performance study, do we tend to reframe experience to support prior beliefs or for consistency? Will I think that the measures of performance task was actually fun when it wasn't if I can come up with no better explanation for lying about how it was fun? Other people are 7.5 out of 9 quite susceptible to this bias, and I am also quite susceptible to this bias, but less susceptible, 6.75 out of 9. What does all this have to do with expertise? Well, it has a lot to do with metacognition, which is important for expertise. It's tough to be the best if you're not self-aware. One thing experts should nearly universally be expected to do is communicate with other experts. This is in part how experts go from being very skilled to being experts. But where there are other people, there are disagreements. And if the average person is walking around thinking that everyone else is more biased than they are, and then they encounter a person whose views differ from their own, it's a very easy conclusion to come to, to say this other person's thinking differs from mine due to their bias. They are, after all, more biased than I am. And this can shut this potential expert off from learning from this individual who has an alternate view about something. So it's a caution that the Lake Wobegon effect for all of these individual biases may get in the way of your learning new things, and perhaps the very specific new things you need to increase your awareness and skills to the level of expertise. In other words, it's supremely useful for an expert or a potential expert to not assume that differences in opinion or analysis are due to errors in thinking on the part of the people around her, but rather to think that where differences exist, they may exist because of reasons. Just like you hold your beliefs for reasons, Perhaps beliefs or analyses that come to a different conclusion than the one that you have have something to teach you. I bring this up here near the end of the final lecture of the course because this course is actually presenting you with a toolbox, the contents of which could be misused to interpret pretty much anything that disagrees with you as stemming from a litany of biases, heuristics, defenses, and faulty mechanisms. In other words, what you learn in this course could make you quote-unquote better at attributing 
views that differ from yours to bias. Please don't fall into that trap. The more someone else's beliefs or interpretations differ from yours, the more you are likely to attribute those beliefs to biases in the other person. But of course, those who agree with us, we tend to treat a bit more like we treat ourselves. That is, we tend to think that they came to their beliefs through right and objective analysis. And there's the word objective. In common use, subjective seems to mean dispassionate or detached or unbiased. But of course, we're not detached from the world. We're quite tied to the facts that we know, the theories and hypotheses that we hold. We accept and we know these things because they mean something to us. Objectivity may be an ideal or a worthy abstract goal, but if you turn up the dial on objectivity, you actually get detachment. If you are an objective observer, strictly speaking, that would mean that the thing you're observing is not important to you. If it's worth your time or attention, then fortunately you are not objective. Even if the thing under consideration is somehow in fact absolutely removed from your circle of care, I would argue that if you are addressing it, you would still prefer to be correct about it, or consistent, or you would want your stance on the issue to be the socially appropriate one. In other words, we're not removed, we're not objective about anything, and we wouldn't actually want to be. My advice would be, if you find yourself saying that you're objective about something, consider that thought to be a warning to yourself that you might be fooling yourself about something. If you in fact are objective about it, well then maybe you're lying to yourself about the fact that it's important to you. If it's in fact important to you, well then you're lying by saying that you are objective about it. And maybe you need to remind yourself that you have an investment in it that might help you recall what's important about the issue, the decision, the problems that you're trying to solve. Next, experts engage. You develop expertise by engaging with your topic. Here is Lev Vygotsky's zone of proximal development. You are developing when your level of competence and your level of challenge are optimized with each other such that you don't fly up into anxiety because you're over challenged nor do you fly into boredom because you're too competent for the task this is where you're growing as a person as a learner as a performer towards expertise what else does this look like it looks like Mihai Csikszentmihalyi's graph of flow optimize the difficulty level to your skill level and you'll get lost in your work. You'll be able to work for hours at a time, not realizing how much time has passed. Because you're engrossed in the challenge, it's fun. And as B.F. Skinner liked to say, the organism is rewarded simply for being effective. And if you're using the highest level of your skill, and in fact improving your skill level, while meeting the most difficult task that you currently can within that zone of proximal development, well, then you're racing your way towards expertise. The third graph acknowledges on the x-axis that one of the things working here is time, which could bring us to Anders Ericsson's 10,000-hour rule. This was popularized by Malcolm Gladwell in his book Outliers. Ericsson observed that at least certain types of experts seemed to endorse the conclusion that it takes about 10,000 hours of deliberate practice at a task in order to reach an expert level of performance. Now keep in mind the definition of expert. It's relative to those around you. You are the best. It's not just skilled. It's expertise. And also keep in mind that Erickson was looking at things like being an expert musician or an expert athlete, and the 10,000 hours were of deliberate practice. So this is time spent in your zone of proximal development, working on what's difficult for you. In other words, there are lots of specific conditions on the 10,000 hour rule, which tends to get rather overapplied. But Erickson is certainly not wrong that it takes a lot of time to be an expert. The phrase I like to use is, well, you've got to get up pretty early in the morning if you want to be the best at that. In most cases, you're going to go 
to the person who's put in the most hours studying, working, improving, understanding the thing that you need an expert for. Finally, something we've probably drilled into your head effectively in this course already, caution. Question, where are your thoughts coming from? Your big, impressive brain with its expert level performance, how do you trace your conclusions backward? Well, we can look at a comparable problem by asking, where do the thoughts of Amazon and Google come from? How do they make search or product recommendations? Well, they take the input that they have regarding your behavior, your clicking, your purchasing, your adjusting your searches. It sends those inputs through an associative learning node, or two, or ten, or five million, and in this hidden computational layer, it looks at your data, it looks at cases like you, it looks at other individuals who have clicked on this thing, what else they have clicked on, what other words got people who also clicked on this thing to clicking on it. So the output or the recommendation here stated as R is a function of your input, what you have done, and other people's input that the hidden layer deems relevant. This Bayesian hidden layer is an untraceable bit of the process between the input that you gave to Amazon or to Google and the output that it gives you. In other words, the Bayesian computational layer is a black box much like your brain is a black box. We can't map it backwards, we can't even map it forwards again to get the exact same result because the hidden layer is always changing. And if you want to give it the same input again, well you gave that input previously and the network has already learned that you gave that information previously. So it's always changing and it's difficult to determine how actually the output came about. Now one observation that cognitive science has made about experts is that they have to do a lot less thinking and less exploring and data gathering to come to the correct conclusion. A more experienced doctor will likely appear to not be doing much work when she palpates certain parts of your body, feels for swollen lymph nodes, more experienced law enforcement officers will catch more suspicious activity in simulations and in the real world with shorter exposure to the relevant information needed to make the decision. Basically, with expertise, you train your body and your brain to such an extent that your system one is now doing the work that that over the course of painstaking deliberate practice has become habit to you. So when your system one goes to do its copy-paste, its quick and dirty associative problem solving, it's doing so correctly and efficiently, but by virtue of being system one, untraceably. So we're presented with the same problem at the expert level that we were presented with in the rest of life, but now the system we're questioning is an impressive, well-oiled, well-developed machine. There may be special challenges, special difficulties involved in questioning or evaluating with our System 2, our System 1 expertise. So, from Tetlock and Gardner's book, Super Forecasters, we have five characteristics of good expert predictors. First, frequent updating. One thing that can be predictive of the success of an individual's prediction is odd numbers or overly specific types of numbers. Tetlock and Gardner would tell you that if there were three people making an estimate as to whether a given political figure is going to be elected, if one of the estimates is 70%, one of the estimates is 85%, and one of the estimates is 85.2%. If they know nothing else, they're going to go with the individual who estimated 85.2%. Why? Because it's at least a surface level indicator that the person maybe put more than one thought or more than one guess together to come to their answer. Well, if I say 85.2, that might mean that I wanted to say 85, and then I thought about it a second time, and I said, well, maybe it's slightly more than 85. Let's go 85.2. So this second thought, this update, is what Tetlock and Gardner are looking for. And sometimes, 
the updating is indicated in these odd pseudo-specific types of estimates. Next, you're looking for, in an expert, someone who will admit uncertainty. They may tell you how sure they are of something. They may tell you, well, it's likely going to be 5 degrees tomorrow, but I could be off by 3, so I'm going to say 5 plus or minus 3. Experts put in the work, and they figure out how to do the research that they need. Expertise grows in an environment of fast feedback. This is a challenge for lots of disciplines, where if you're wrong, you may never learn that you were wrong, or you may only learn a month or two or a year later, in which case you're not learning as effectively as if you had learned right away. So this is one of the reasons why... Some uh, medical specialties, like radiologists, might not improve at the same rate as individuals in other professions. One fast feedback type of profession is coding. So if you are maybe a software designer, you write a bit of code, you compile and test it right away. If it doesn't work, you go in, you punch something else in or make some corrections, you can test it right away. This environment of fast feedback is conducive of making building expertise. It's one of the reasons why it's still tough to compete with flashcards. It's still tough for a lot of learning to beat uh, flashcards because you can because you can get your guess, you can get your answer validated or falsified right away. If you think the definition is A and you say, okay, well, I think it's A and then you flip the card over and you're wrong, you have a, an environment of fast feedback to help you memorize better the things you need to memorize. Finally, because it is not an easy thing to do, from memory, expert predictors, as Tedlock and Gardner have studied them, track their own successes and failures. Especially the failures, because that is presumably where you have the most to learn. There's plenty of stories of professional athletes who, after winning the highest title in their sport, Instead of taking time to celebrate, obsessing over what they did wrong over the course of their successful performance. Note that most of these five characteristics of good expert predictors refer to errors. So updating, well that means getting rid of outdated knowledge. Admitting uncertainty, well that means acknowledging error and predicting it. Environment of faster feedback. Well, that's so that you can give yourself more chance to be wrong or to be shaped by your correct and incorrect actions. And tracking success and failure. So there's a lot of caution called for here. But of course, if you want to increase your fail rate, you have to act. So here's a quote from a great book. We don't ask that people poke out their eyes to prevent them from making mistaken eyewitness identifications. Instead, we demonstrate the power of perceptual mischief via optical illusions and courses in perceptual psychology. Imagine how different dialogue might be with future generations raised on the idea that there are biological constraints on our ability to know what we know. To me, that is our only hope. That's from a book called On Being Certain. Now here's one from Catherine Schulz in her book, Being Wrong. This is one of the most defining and dangerous characteristics of certainty. It is toxic to a shift in perspective. If imagination is what enables us to conceive of and enjoy stories other than our own, and if empathy is the act of taking other people's stories seriously, certainty deadens or destroys both qualities. So, certainty is lethal to two of our most redeeming and humane qualities, imagination and empathy. How does one become an expert? Learning, engagement, and caution. Be capable of being wrong, get the data and its context, update your beliefs, Work the hard cases to stay in your zone of proximal development and in flow, and stay humble, open, and observant. Good luck. We'll see you around.